remote talks. Uh, the first talk is Stefano Giacari, who will talk about Moyal Yangmes theory and higher spin in flat space time. Hey, thank you a lot. Uh, first of all, let me thank you, the, all the organizers, and in particular Harold, for the possibility of being here. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, some work that uh, I've done uh, in, let's say, more or less uh, uh, recent years uh, with uh, Luciano Bonora, Maro Spitan, Predag Dominis Pester, and a two PhD student. Uh, Matteo Paulisic and Ivan Vukovic. Okay, uh, as we heard already in uh, some talks yesterday, uh, higher spin is in, uh, increasingly the object of interest. Even from the phenomenological point of view, where it has uh, possibly some applications uh, in, dark, uh, in uh, dark matter. But uh, of course, uh, uh, the main interest uh, is uh, from the theoretical point of view, and it has been put in relation to the possibility to avoid the causality problem, and also in uh, getting uh, a soft UV behavior in consistent theories of quantum gravity. And, uh, another, uh, on another side, from the point of view of the string, of, of the, string the tensionless limit is very interesting because it's just the limit in which uh, 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 RSFT can be studied with detail and possibly even understood. And uh, okay, there is also the, by now quite, uh, let's say, not so recent dream of being able to explain the physical string as a, a kind of, of, uh, of a spontaneously broken theory from some underlying gauge, see, gauge theory. Okay. Unfortunately, in spite of all this promise, higher spins are uh, affected by a problem from the theoretical point of view. In particular, the, the attempts to construct an action in the standard sense that we mean by action in space-time have faced the problem with the non-locality at, uh, non at the level of the quartic interactions. This in some sense suggests that uh, higher spin gravity, if it exists, uh, it must exist beyond the boundaries uh, of standard local quantum field theory. Okay, in some sense, this talk uh, is in the perspective of showing that uh, even from a very basic point of view, one seems to be naturally led to adopting in some sense uh, a kind of non-commutative geometry structure. Okay, as I said, uh, we want to start uh, from a uh, very basic point of view. So, okay, let's consider uh, every field action in flat space time. It's a kind of obvious observation that it can uh, be written uh, in the first quantized value formalism in this kind uh, of, operator, uh, of operator way. Here, uh, X and U are my conjugate uh, operator, one uh, is a coordinate and one is momentum, if you, if you want. Okay. Now, once we write in this, let's say, matrix-like form, it is quite evident that uh, we can, uh, let's say, easily upgrade the U1 invariance of this model the, to a gauge invariance, to a local invariance. This is done by what we will define, what we will call a minimal prescription, which consists uh, in uh, uh, sorry, which consists in sending uh, the operator U UA in a generic uh, in an operator which is a function of X and U E A. Okay, assuming these uh, these transformation properties. Okay. This is, uh, in some sense, a basic observation. Now, the connection to non-commutative uh, geometry comes uh, in the language uh, of while uh, Wigner quantization, in which we know that uh, an operator can be mapped to the corresponding symbol by the Wigner map, 
and that the product of two operators is associated with the Moyal product of two symbols. And that this Moyal product turns out to be associative to have trace property, of course, and there are also some of the properties like Jacobi, Jacobi identities and so, and so on. Okay, so once this is done, we can write the three matter models uh, that we wrote before in this uh, kind in this kind of form and we can rewrite also in this language the corresponding symmetries here of course uh, i'm using a kind of compact notation r and s can be both uh, internal symmetries uh, but also uh, in the case of spinors uh, they can be the spinner indices okay and uh, as I said, the master field, which is uh, now we are mapping the operator E to the master field, the master field will uh, transform in this kind of a joint representation with respect to this uh, phase transformation. Here are some examples, as I mentioned before, to make it more concrete of what we mean. In the case of the complex Klein Gordon field, this uh, kinetic operator, uh, which is now minimally coupled, is of this, is of this form. This is uh, what happens for the Dirac field. It's uh, simply the standard kinetic operators where we have substituted the, the U, the, uh, the momentum operator, with the EA. Now, of course, uh, uh, the, the reason for the reason we want to exp why I'm doing it is essentially. And uh, here I'm trying to give you some intuition why it is actually related to the higher spin symmetry. The idea is that if we expand, Taylor expand around u equals zero, one finds, of course, uh, the kinetic term that we wrote before, but finds one, one finds also this interacting term. It is interacting term as are just, as you can see, the uh, standard nether couplings to these currents, which are on shell conserved. They are known to be, to contain higher spin, higher spin, representation, higher spin representations. As you see, in the case of the scalar model, the correct object to expand is uh, this G, which is the product, the Moyal product of two EA. And okay, already at this level, it is quite clear that this GA is in some sense uh, an analog uh, in this Moyal language of the metric of the metric of the metric tensor. Here I'm showing how I intend to expand that there is a zero of the term, which is U square, and then there is the field H, which is like uh, the perturbation, which will be also Taylor expanded. And this, here I'm showing the corresponding term and the corresponding currents for a, 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 Dirac, a Dirac spinner. Now, the point is that once this is done and we go and Taylor expand the phase transformation that we showed before, one finds the usual, let's say, the usual higher spin global symmetry. This establishes the connection between, uh, let's say, the, uh, the symmetry that uh, based on the, uh, on the Mugal product and the usual higher spin symmetry. Now, of course, uh, one possibility, once we have this matter, this free matter, uh, minimally coupled, uh, through these currents is in some sense to pursue a uh, approach which is, uh, uh, let's say, in the same perspective of Sakharov's uh, idea of induced gravity and to compute essentially the one loop effective action. This is something that uh, we, uh, that, okay, Descartes first uh, with the collaborators, Jung, Mural, and then also as uh, in the case of the fermion, we did. And okay, one finds that is uh, nice, uh, completely com Okay, completely computable, uh, let's say, one loop corrections. And uh, you can find that in spite of the apparent complexity, this uh, effective action, of course, has an L infinity structure, 
which determines the vertices consistently with the symmetry. So in some sense, uh, for us, uh, the next step uh, was uh, to use uh, completely the power that is the symmetry. And uh, this symmetry has, uh, is relatively simple in the sense that uh, this uh, transformation, the clause, so they have the standard structure of a Lie algebra. And uh, of course, uh, once we have this Lie algebra, we can think of working with two basic representation. The fundamental representation, where the transformation is this, and the joint representation. And I already gave you an example of this, uh, both of these. No? Uh, or actually, I gave you an example of the second one, which is the master feed that I was considering. Now the idea is just uh, to start constructing invariant actions using the building blocks. Okay, at this point, uh, in, uh, in some sense, uh, we need to construct uh, all the user objects that uh, are used uh, in uh, differential calculus, essentially. So, okay, the transformation of the master field can be rewritten in this nice way. That is, uh, we have uh, actually a covariant derivative. And the covariant derivative is of this kind. And now maybe it's more clear why also, why the, the minimal prescription is uh, really consists in substituting a U with this EA, with this master field. Because actually one can prove that this object has all the standard property, properties of a covariant derivative. And once one expands around EA equal U, one actually finds a form that is, let's say, the standard one of, the covari of a covariant derivative around a flat, uh, a flat background. Okay, there is a non-metricity tensor and it is generically different from zero. Well, another uh, standard object to define is uh, the torsion tensor. And this torsion tensor actually turns out, uh, is it turns out to be related uh, once uh, the expansion around uh, the flat background is done to let's say, it has uh, this form, which is uh, the standard field strength and satisfies the, of course, the, the user of Bianchi identities. Now, as I said, we want to construct actions. So the most, the first obvious guess is to construct the Moyal, the Young Mills in this language, which, okay, here we call Moyala higher spina, Young Mills, just because we remind that it's a symmetry is actually related uh, when we go to space time and to free theories to the standard high spin transformation. Of course, uh, as we are working in uh, Weil Wigner formalism, there is a, one can always think of this uh, as a nice uh, matrix model in this language. The equation of motion, uh, so, sorry, the equation of motion have this standard form. And actually, I'll meet a quite rich set of vacua, which satisfy this uh, TAB equal to zero condi condition. And one finds that actually the point around which we were expanding is actually a stable solution of this, uh, condi of, of this condition, perturbatively stable condition. One can also study the symmetries of this uh, action, looking possibly for conserved the charges which are, okay, and actually it is possible to construct an infinite number, an infinite number of conservative charges. Okay, uh, now, one of course can go on with this kind of game of constructing actions, and in particular, uh, maybe it is, uh, is uh, particularly interesting because uh, it's the kind of generalization of a, a cosmological constant ter term. And as it is expected, it actually removes the flat solution. Because of course, we don't expect to have the Minkowski background it is, uh, when this term is added. Then uh, one can construct also objects uh, of this kind, which are essentially, and of course, uh, this is uh, the object of this kind of the lowest dimension, which is the same as the kinetic term. But one can go on with this construction. And can also, and it is possible to define a parity of the terms. 
In particular, in, in a dimension, we have uh, this object, uh, which is constructed in terms of, this, of the, this is a straightforward generalization of the Moyal of the chain tensor, and this is a straightforward generalization of the chain Simon tensor in all the dimension. Okay, uh, the covariant uh, derivative, uh, of course, uh, will be defined according to the representation on which we are working. In a general representation, as I already said, it's uh, this. And then it's possible to define also matter fields in a joint representation using this covariant derivative. This is a, a kind of uh, Majorana spin one alpha field. And this, uh, uh, also this can be written in a set of formulation, of course. And this is the real scalar uh, field with uh, possibly a potential uh, which can be introduced. There is also the possibility of working uh, in the fundamental representation. And here we have somehow more freedom in the sense that there is a this, which is the standard derivative that one would expect around the fat background, but there is also this, this object which behaves as a derivative, but which has the property that for H A equals zero does not reduce simply to the expected derivative, but still both can be used to construct actions. And okay, here essentially are some examples and the trick is always the, in this, uh, to construct uh, Moyal like spin scalars. And uh, you see here, once uh, it, one has a Moyal like spin scalars, here can always have a generic function of U in order to be sure that this uh, integration over U can be safely performed. And these actually are the kind of terms uh, that uh, we started with in order to find uh, the relation to higher spin, uh, the kind of matter theories that uh, we studied in order to find the relation to higher spin. Okay, of course, uh, now there is the problem of giving uh, a physical interpretation of all these objects. One uh, way to find a physical interpretation, okay, and here let's say there are several uh, uh, studies in this direction, several approaches. One, of course, uh, is uh, to try to, to understand what is the emergent uh, geometry on uh, the standard space time. Okay, this can be done uh, expanding actually in, ta in, uh, in a Taylor series. And considering, for example, uh, the lowest spin objects up, up to spin equal to, let's say. Once this is done, one finds transformation that are actually exactly the same, ex the, the one expected for the U1 gauge vector and therefore the field band. And this is also confirmed by the expansion of the metric tensor. And we see that here we find the, again, the expected, uh, this, uh, the expected relation between the metric and the field band. And these uh, are actually single terms that are expected in the coupling, for example, the scalar, which is not minimally coupled to gravity. Okay, one can of course also try to understand, make connection between the, der the covariant derivative that we found in the uh, moyal vile formalism and the one that actually is induced on the space time. And using this relation, one can actually find that the connection, and in particular, this connection turns out to be uh, non-metric in the sense that there is a non-null non-metricity. And uh, actually, in the end, uh, one turns out to find that the connection is, a, is exactly the opposite of the Weizenbock uh, one, and so is uh, the torsion. The torsion is the opposite of the one in teleparallel gravity. And actually, this is the relation between uh, the two derivative, the two covariant derivatives. Okay. Of course, uh, the Taylor expansion is uh, okay when we try to understand what is the induced uh, metric, but uh, it is the problem uh, that uh, 
when we consider the actually here, uh, these are the equation of motion around the flat background. When we consider this equation of motion and we expand it in Taylor uh, series, we naively and most immediately find ghost modes in the sense that, okay, this is actually to be expected for this kind of models. Okay, we investigated uh, in particular one possibility. One possibility to try to get out of this problem is uh, to use an autonomous set of functions in your space. And these uh, autonomous set of functions in your space uh, automatically, of course, define a unitary kinetic term, which is uh, actually of the Maxwell type uh, diagonal uh, kind. Okay, in Euclidean uh, signature, this is uh, in some sense completely obvious in the sense that uh, such a basis of course exists and uh, it consists of finite domain, sorry, of finite dimensional uh, irreducible representation of SOD. And in particular one that uh, we use in concrete computations was this basis, which is based uh, essentially on uh, Hermit polynomials. Okay, this is the standard defini definition of Hermit polynomial. One, of course, uh, there is the problem that uh, this basis in uh, Minkowski spacetime seems to naively break, uh, in some sense, Lorentz invariance because of this uh, exponential. Five minutes, okay. But, uh, um, essentially, we think that still one can, in some sense, use this kind of basis, considering infinite dimensional unit, unitary representations. This is actually a few a infinite dimensional unitary representation of SU1 D minus one. And one can identify these sectors which transform into themselves under Lorentz transformation. Whether this, uh, with this, uh, this, of course, unitary, the only problem is that one cannot use the standard tensor representation that we are using the two in, uh, uh, let's say, working with the standard quantum field theories. It looks like in some sense, uh, if we want to avoid the unitarity problem, we must automatically live in an infinite, uh, in an infinite uh, dimensional represent representation. So in this sense, this theory is, uh, if we want a unit, a uni, unitarity, it's, uh, it, it is quite on a standard. Okay, of course, uh, the trick that I have done, uh, that I've showed you for the kinetic term can be easily extended uh, uh, to the three and four vertices. It is, uh, can be done, but in particular, it can be done quite conveniently in this Hermit basis because one has uh, such a nice property as orthonormality, recursion relations, uh, and uh, linearization properties uh, that allow actually to compute these uh, objects explicitly. They are just uh, very messy here. Uh, of course, I don't expect this uh, formalized particularly suggestive of anything. I just want to give you a, feed, a feeling that it is possible to be done. Okay, this is the three vertex, but I could have written also the four, the four vertex in a slide, okay. Then, uh, okay, the next, uh, step and the last thing that I want to show you is that this can be explicitly done, uh, can be, this formula is, can be explicitly used to compute the amplitudes. Now they do uh, this, uh, here we consider a very trivial example, which is the, the four point amplitude, the Feynman diagram, uh, Feynman uh, amplitude with the standard, uh, let's say now the propagator uh, in this Maxwell like action as a very under the form. Okay, we did the computation with this minimal space time Dirac field. And here essentially one finds this form factor. And one can compute explicitly this amplitude, which has this remarkable ultra local behavior, which is just due to the resummation essentially over the infinite power of fields that we are including. And this is a consequence of the orthonormality relation that we are using. The other possibility is uh, to use, uh, for example, the master graph fields. These are just examples. 
Also here we can compute the form factor. And again, the computation can be done. And here it is interesting because one finds a quite, let's say, appealing UV soft behavior. But of course, this is just, uh, let's say, the few amplitudes that we computed. Okay, let me draw the conclusion. In some sense, uh, this is uh, interesting because it's an alternative to what people usually do, usually try and uh, try for a long time to do in a higher spin, that is uh, to implement uh, the solution of the nether problem from a down top uh, approach. Here we are starting from a gauge symmetry and we are reconstructing the possible uh, actions which are determined by the tens of calculus. Okay, there are uh, all the, these are uh, all the appealing properties that I showed you. There is a induced uh, geometry. There is possibly the chance to avoid gauss. Uh, scattering up can be explicitly computed and have this nice property which uh, has actually been uh, let's say, shown to be interesting from the dark matter perspective. Supersymmetrization uh, is uh, straightforward in this approach, uh, and actually we did uh, in one uh, re uh, report. Okay, of course, now there is uh, to reach, to study this uh, completely, this uh, rich landscape of classical solutions, and to address uh, the general problem of the vacua. In this approach, uh, we can perform the RCT quantization of the model. And so we can actually go, for example, to study this matrix at one loop, possibly. And it would be interesting to check, for example, whether we find that this one loop finitest that was find, found for the Kerala ISP in gravity uh, defined uh, by these uh, guys. Okay, also it would be interesting to uh, generalize to ADS for possible applications, for example, to ADS FT in the perspective also of some talks that were given previously. Okay, thank you a lot for your attention and uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> so the canonical question by how okay. so sorry to ask you so many questions. Um but it seems to me that that your construction is exactly the same thing as the, the matrix model approach to non-commutative gauge theory. And, and, and moreover, the, the fact that you consider this higher dimensional Moya wire space is, is precisely another ma manifestation of the issue, which was also in the previous talk, that you have really kind of a non-compact fiber over space time, which is the origin of higher spin, and which is also the origin of the issue with ghosts and so on. And the solution of this issue is precisely what I talked about on Monday. These are precisely the Korean quantum space times, which leads to the higher spin theories of a couple of last papers. And the, the way that, how it resolves these issues is because then the internal space is compact rather than non-compact, and then you don't have ghosts. But we should discuss this after. Yeah, I am very interested, okay. of course, in discussing here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, I agree. Yeah, in the end, uh, it's a remarkable similarity. Yes, in the, but I just wanted to show that we started from a different perspective and we arrived more or less in similar. Question. Yeah, so I have any other questions? Ah, okay. Uh, can you comment uh, if there is some connection or maybe on a difference uh, from the Vasily formulation because it's also based on some non-commutative non-mayal structures and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, infinity algebra. So. Okay, a very obvious difference uh, is that, for ex okay, for the moment this construction is uh, only done uh, on uh, flat uh, Minkowski background, while Vasily formulation assumes uh, ADS uh, background. And also, okay, the point is that here we are constructing an action, actually. We are giving an action principle, while in Vasily, usually you start from the action, from the equation of, mo of motion. So, okay, and the, here we have an explicit uh, non-commutative uh, space on which we are uh, really working, and which in some sense encodes the non-locality, okay? Because uh, the main issue of this kind of theories is actually 
to put the non-locality under some kind of non-con or over a control, because uh, otherwise, of course, uh, any solution to the nether problem would be possible if you don't care about locality. So in some sense, it, from our perspective, this approach gives uh, a way to manage this locality problem. So I don't see other questions, either here nor online, so we think Stefan again. Speaker is uh, Carlo Yaziola. Very good. And he's uh, talking about unfolding and higher spins, space time fiber duality resolution of classical singularities. Uh, Carlo, I would warn you uh, five minutes before 25 minutes. Okay. Right. Can you actually hear, see me, and uh, see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, very well. Okay. All right. So let me begin by thanking the organizers for putting this conference together and uh, giving me a chance to speak. So today I would like to uh, talk about some interesting feature of the uh, unfolded formulation, which is the formulation that lies at the heart of the nonlinear higher spin equations written down by Vasiliev, and on some resolution mechanisms of uh, uh, gravitational singularities that become uh, that are suggested by the embedding of gravity inside higher spin gravity, and by looking at it via the lens of unfolding. So. Um, I will essentially recall the definition of high spin algebras and master fields and unfolded formulation, which lie at the heart of uh, the Vasiliev formulation. Uh, well, point out a specially striking feature of this formulation, uh, which I refer to as space time fiber duality. And then move on to see how uh, these features can actually uh, help us um, rethink uh, certain gravitational singularities. In particular, I will look at uh, uh, curvature singularities uh, inside Schwarzschild black holes and uh, degenerate metrics like those of BTZ type of, uh, um, of backgrounds. So um, by high spin gravity, one has in mind the dynamics of an infinite multiplet of gauge fields of all spins. So literally we're talking about the first rigid trajectory uh, collapsed at zero mass somehow uh, when we're talking about gauge fields. So each field comes with its own gauge symmetry, local symmetry. And uh, this is conjectured to be a holographic dual of one of the simplest system you can actually think of, namely uh, a, a free CFT. And somehow as it's been uh, stressed in uh, uh, recent talks, this is to be thought of as a minimal extension of gravity with massless ice cream fields. So a toy model really for quantum gravity. And it is somehow a system of intermediate complexity between that of supergravity and of, and of the full string theory. And yet, uh, as was stressed also uh, by Stefan in the previous talk, uh, there are some features that really uh, drive it away from ordinary field theories that we're used to. So, for example, a certain degree of non-locality is involved in the fully non-linear theory. And also, the important, uh, another very important fact is that um, as the uh, spin two uh, transformation, transformations do not commute with higher spin transformations, concepts like that of uh, coming from the standard Riemannian geometry are not higher spin invariant. And therefore, they need to be replaced to some generalization of them that is more like um, proper for a description of a high energy stringy regime. Also, uh, another motivation for me in this talk that I will try to stress is the fact that this mathematical framework called unfolded formulation that has been devised by Vasiliev to handle this complicated system is also turns out to be interesting in its own right somehow. And it can be powerful to address some certain important questions within has been gravity, but also outside of it. So I will not discuss the nonlinear formulation of uh, uh, Vasiliev, but I will 
uh, used the unfolded formulation, which I will recall, to look at three equations and um, essentially to help with uh, identifying um, uh, how, how essentially the embedding of gravitational singularities into high spin gravity may uh, help uh, in, in constructing resolution uh, mechanisms. So let me start by recalling the definition of four-dimensional bosonic high spin algebra. There are actually uh, several uh, equivalent definitions, but uh, one which is uh, particularly useful and also uh, very much in modern uh, current definition that's been used is the algebra of all linear transformation of the space of on-shell states of a boundary massless scalar. That is to say, it's an infinite dimensional extension of the ADS isometry algebra, S3,2, ADS4 isometry algebra, which is also the conformal group of the boundary, Minkowski 3, that acts transitively on, on, uh, on D, uh, D being, meaning the states of a boundary mass scale. Concretely, what this means is that the, the algebras are obtained by taking a quotient uh, of the universal enveloping algebra of S3,2. Uh, certain, essentially, that means that to every spin S generator, let's call it TS, by that I mean the, the symmetry generator associated to a gauge field of spin S, that object is realized as a uh, S minus one degree monomial in the uh, MAB, which are the spin two uh, ADS isometry algebra generators, with a certain young projection that won't be of relevance in this talk. So the MABs satisfy obviously the SO3,2 uh, algebra and uh, um, they can be uh, actually divided further according to um, the Lorentz uh, subalgebra, which whose generator will denote with MAB with uh, small case AB. And the leftover generators will be the ADS transvections, uh, non-commuting translation PA, or according to the uh, compact subalgebra, uh, which is spanned by the spatial translation MRS energy and the energy E. So uh, in that case, one isolates the energy E from the, which is nothing else than P naught from the ADS transvections. And the remaining generators are ranging to spatial translations BR and, uh, and uh, uh, energy raising and lowering operators L plus minus R. Now, if one takes two uh, generators of uh, spin S and S prime, you can see from the commutation relation that essentially the, uh, the commutator uh, produces uh, generators of spin higher than S and S prime and lower as well. So uh, what the, the upshot here is that as soon as one spin higher than two is introduced, uh, the algebra doesn't close anymore on a finite set of spins and you have to really introduce all of them. In fact, the minimal truncation one can do is to introduce all even spins. Uh, this algebra actually admits a useful oscillator realization, uh, which essentially stems from the fact that SO3,2 does. Uh, the SO3,2 algebra can be realized in terms of bilinears in oscillators, as you can see there. And maybe can be realized as a bilinear. Uh, and uh, the, the oscillators themselves satisfy uh, Heisenberg algebra, as it's written down here. And by that uh, correspondence, a spin S generator is actually uh, realized by a symmetrized monomial in Ys of degree two times S minus one. Now, uh, because of uh, it, it is customary in, in the theory to actually implement the totally symmetric ordering by working with symbols of operators, so commuting variables wise. That, however, in, in order to implement the operator product on them, one uh, makes use of the Moyal star product, the non commutative product law. So, whenever in the following you will see an, uh, a star product, it's going to be, in fact, an operator product among uh, commuting variables. Implemented on commuting by the bottom. I and uh, whenever you see simple just juxtaposition, ordinary products, that is the symbol of a totally symmetrized operator. Okay, uh, we won't really need many of uh, the details. This is just not to be surprised when in the following one sees expressions like the, follow the, the following ones here. Uh, 
So these are the natural variable in which one formulates the equation. Number one, it's pretty easy to guess uh, once one has presented the algebra that way, because this is the algebra one is going to gauge, then the natural variable is a young mills like adjoint one form, which literally admits an expansion, a power series expansion in Y and Y bar. And uh, in, uh, in the adjoint representation here, the spin S sector uh, included in, in this expansion is finite dimensional. It is spanned by those generators such that the number of Y's and the number of uh, Y bars uh, sum up to two times S minus one. Uh, so every spin S sector indeed contains here as coefficients of this power series, all the gauge fields uh, physical gauge fields and auxiliary connections that are necessary for the free uh, unfolded formulation. But this actually cannot be the only player for various reasons. Um, first of all, because uh, the, the uh, irreducible, irreducible representation of uh, uh, the high spin algebra also includes a scalar. And also because this zero form that allocates the scalar is actually key to write equation in unfolded form. And this zero form is, uh, lives in a representation which is different from the adjoint. It's called twisted adjoint. And the very important difference is that here, the spin S sector is actually infinite dimensional. Every spin S sector is uh, infinite dimensional. It's spanned by infinitely many generators, all those such that the difference between barred and unbarred variables is equal to 2S. Um, in fact, the absolute value of that difference. We will see in a moment how this uh, come into play. But first of all, let me define what it's meant by unfolded formulation. So unfolding really means just formulating equations in terms of zero curvature and covariant constancy condition forming a free differential algebra. So what it means is the following, that uh, the, this is a formulation that, first of all, is uh, in principle uh, available for any dynamical system. Any dynamical system can be reformulated this way by adding enough many auxiliary fields. And essentially, it's some sort of uh, fully covariant Hamilton, Hamiltonian formulation, if you want. So one sees only first order equation, only in terms of differential form. So there is never a Mm, a special role played by the metric in contracting indices here. And uh, they were introduced, in fact, uh, was studied in mathematics by Sullivan, notably introduced in physics by Dowry and Frey. And then uh, uh, the contribution of Vasily was mainly to, uh, was actually this uh, uh, zero form, um, uh, introducing zero forms playing a specific role within this twisted joint representation that I just uh, mentioned, and uh, we will see now in the following how this plays a role. Uh, well, uh, so in general, by free differential algebra, one means a set of uh, P forms, let's denote them by omega A, subject to a generalized zero curvature condition like this D omega plus Q of omega equals zero, where this Q is just a um, construct of the uh, forms, uh, present differential forms in the system, only uh, uh, built via a wedge product. And uh, these equations need to be compatible with d squared into zero, which sets a condition on q. Uh, in fact, q has to square to zero. So q is actually a homological vector in uh, uh, target space here. And this severely constrains the structure that one can put in Q and also guarantees invariance under uh, local transformations of the form that you see there at the bottom of the slide, which means that there is a gauge parameter associated to any P form with P greater than zero. Only zero forms do not introduce extra uh, gauge conditions and uh, are the only fields that in fact transform homogeneously, which basically means well, that's the upshot, but the, the idea is that uh, degrees of freedom, local degrees of freedom are really carried by zero forms here. Oops, something went wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, there was some update that started. Um, so I need to, sorry, uh, I will have to go to... Sorry about that. Can you hear me still? 
Halo? Ya, Oke. Okay. Can you hear me? Ya. So, so, sorry, I didn't get it. Can you? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you. And you can still see the screen now. Yes, we see. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, there was some automatic update that started. Anyway, so uh, yes, uh, I was saying that basically zero forms will carry the degrees of freedom in these theories. So, moving on. Um, the point is that now the Vassiliev system now is uh, the full fully nonlinear is such that it admits an expansion in this uh, zero form phi such that at zero order in the zero form the only equation that remains there is the one that uh, defines the ADS vacuum connection in terms of, well it's just a flat uh, condition a flatness condition on on uh, on a connection omega which is solved in the bilinear sector by the standard uh, ADS flat connection. Uh, and then at first order, there appear also the uh, equation for the free propagation over anti decita written in unfolded language. So let me show you. Um, so uh, indeed, uh, as I said, the flat connection, the flatness condition can be solved in the bilinear sector by the ADS, um, uh, ADS uh, connection. With you can feed the features, you can see the Lorentz connection as well as the field bind in the expansion over the y y bar and y y bar sector. And the latter can also be written as it's a flat connection by uh, uh, with the help of a gauge function of sp four r, which is nothing but isometric. To, uh, it's just exactly um, isomorphic to so three comma two. So it's just a gauge function, and you can write omega as L minus one star DL. Now, different choices now of coordinates for uh, the, your ADS manifold are, correspond to different choices of uh, gauge function that are adapted to the coordinates that one is choosing. For example, if one wants to represent ADS in stereographic coordinates, one chooses this element L stereo, which has indeed the Lorentz covariant exponential of the transvections. Whereas the global spherical uh, coordinate system for anti decita 4 uh, can be obtained by using L spherical, uh, where you can see that basically the energy, uh, the, the energy time circle has been singled out uh, and energy singled out by the, from the uh, spatial translations. So anyway, to every coordinate system, one can associate a given L, that's the upshot, and then one proceeds and uh, uh, it looks at the equation at first order over this background. At first order, one sees um, uh, a covariant constancy condition for this phi, for the zero form. Um, and covariant derivative is taken with respect to the uh, background connection omega. And essentially, all the reason for calling this representation that phi belongs to a twisted joint is that on, on it, the, the covariant derivative acts with uh, not a commutator, but a twisted commutator with this pi, which basically means that it's a commutator graded with respect to the translations generator. Um, okay, this is very important because that's precisely responsible for the fact that the spin S sector is infinite dimensional. And also, uh, uh, there is a gluing of the degrees of freedom in, of, in residing inside the zero form phi into uh, the one form sector. So the, uh, the two equations together really contain, as was shown by Vasiliev, all the free uh, propagation on for every spin S field on anti the sitter. Um, the meaning of the second equation is essentially that uh, uh, the uh, certain components within phi are set equal to vile tensors. So uh, traceless combination of the curvatures of the gauge fields in W. And uh, uh, on these vile tensors, physical field equations are uh, in fact imposed and are contained in the uh, equation for the zero form phi. In fact, that zero form phi, if one opens up all the spin S sector, contains the Klein Gordon on the spin zero uh, representative. Maxwell on the spin one, and then generalized Bergman-Wigner equation for spin two and higher. Uh, 
And all the remaining identities simply identify higher tensors with derivatives of the physical fields of the Weyl tensor without any further uh, dynamical condition. Okay, let me, let's look a little bit more to the zero form equation, which as I said, essentially propagates the physical degrees of freedom. Um, okay, yes, in every spin a sector, we said what the content is, but uh, the equation on the generating function on phi of X and Y is a zero curvature condition and it's first order, obviously. So what it means is that uh, the, it imposes a relation between the space-time behavior and the fiber behavior, X and Y behavior of its solutions. And this is concretely manifested in the fact that one can, being a zero uh, curvature condition with respect to a connection which is written in terms of a gauge function, L minus one star DL, well, then one can immediately solve the uh, d zero phi equal to zero equation in terms by with the help of a gauge function, uh, just letting uh, the gauge function act twisted a joint way on this phi, and this means that the locally one can completely gauge away the space time dependence enti entirely store it into the gauge function l, and uh, uh, the gauge function l simply rotates an element which is uh, purely Y dependent and that represents the master field phi at a single point X naught in space time, the point where uh, the gauge function L becomes trivial. So, well, this may be surprising. Essentially, uh, we are saying that all the degrees of freedom, the local degrees of freedom are contained in an X independent element, uh, phi prime uh, of Y, but that's, uh, not so strange if you think about the meaning of it, because essentially that, uh, as we said, phi contains all on shell and trivial derivatives of the physical fields. That means that once you set that into a specific space-time point, X naught, let's say, then what you have is uh, all the local data that you need to uh, reconstruct the field in a Taylor expansion around that point. And this is what L really does. So L spreads this datum in space-time via Taylor expansion. This story particularly... Sorry? Five minutes left. Oh, wow, okay. Um, this essentially means that properties of space-time solutions are mirrored by corresponding ones of this element phi prime. And that's what uh, I refer to as space-time fiber duality. So literally one can... Um, retrieve solution spaces uh, um, to the differential equations in uh, ADS space time by playing with that phi prime, with the phi element. So certain differential condition on the space time fields are actually mirrored into algebraic conditions on this phi prime of Y. At three level, one could say literally the local degrees of freedom in unfolded system are contained in phi prime and whereas boundary and boundary degrees of freedom in the gauge are introduced via the gauge function. Okay, but uh, so uh, for example, let me give you a quick example of this duality. Well, the ground state of the massless scalar mode uh, in anti de Sitter is obtained usually by solving the klein gordon equation, choosing the regular branch, imposing Neumann boundary condition, and that leads to quantization of energies with lowest eigenvalue one. And after all these conditions are, after the, you obtain the solution and impose the conditions, you are left with uh, an object which looks like this, e to the minus i t over square root of one plus r squared in a, a global ADS coordinates. The same object can be obtained in a simpler way by essentially solving the equation in one shot with uh, uh, the gauge function, as I was uh, saying before, and then imposing uh, conditions, algebraic condition on phi prime, that it be a rotational invariant and that the energy eigenvalue is one. This selects a specific, in, singles out a specific phi prime and then by rotating it with the gauge function and extracting the scalar field, you retrieve exactly the same object that uh, uh, I've showed you before. So now on to curvature singularities. 
Well, nonlinear equations, uh, uh, high spin equations, admit solutions which are black hole like in the sense that there's a tower of uh, vial tensors for every spin S, and the spin two element is exactly identical to that of an EDS4 spatial black hole. And you can see that for every spin S, you have a vial tensor of, of the sort you, that you see here. Uh, U plus and minus are just the principal spinners carrying the spinner structure. But uh, what's important here, you look at the uh, dependence with um, the radial dependence is one over R to the S plus one. So for S equal two, with one over R to the third, which is exactly the type of singularity you expect in the origin for a spatial black hole. And that's essentially all you could say starting looking at component fields. Component fields are indeed singular, but the divergences of the individual vial tensors acquire somewhat clearer meaning at the level of the generating function, uh, phi x and y. The generating function of these objects is actually a Gaussian in y space. And r features, if you look at the form, uh, where R features in the generating function, that's exactly uh, like the small parameter of a delta sequence. So when R goes to zero, this uh, generating function approaches a delta function of the oscillators. So curvature singularities, once you put them, uh, once you embed gravity into high spin gravity and you have a representative of every spin S field of these uh, singular vial tensors, Actually, uh, what it means, what happens is that they assemble all the curvature singularities into a non-analytic behavior for the vial tensor generating function. So this is a little better though, because while uh, individual sing singularities of the vial tensor are just singularities of the vial tensor, nothing more, a delta function of non-commutative variables is in some sense smooth. It is smooth in the sense that it is well behaved under star product. So the sort of the component field picture loses meaning on the singularity, at the singularity, but not the deformed uh, uh, differential algebra that the master fields actually span. That may still make sense, actually. So uh, in the last uh, minute, I will uh, uh, just quickly tell you about a different kind of singularity that one can hope to solve by these uh, means, and that is degenerate metrics. So uh, the, the difference here is that if one wants to try and disentangle degenerate metrics from curvature singularities, it is better to study the embedding in high spin gravity of different gravitational solutions that possess degenerate metrics, but on which the curvature doesn't diverge. For example, the BTZ4 background to remain in four dimensions. So it is less known that its counterpart in three dimensions, but BTZ black holes can be actually lifted to uh, four and higher dimension. This is pioneered by, was pioneered by Aminabor, Benson, Brill, Holtz, Temple, Dan, and studied then further by Bagnados, Gomberov, and Martinez. Now, BTZ4, much like BTZ3, contains causal singularity. So it's geodesically incomplete. There are time-like geodesics that terminate at a certain surface. And it, they are obtained via identification from ADS4. The identification takes place along a, a killing vector field, which is actually uh, the vector field corresponding to one of the transvections. That means that the norm isn't uh, positive definite inside uh, anti the sitter. There are regions where uh, xi, the norm xi squared of this uh, killing vector field is negative. That means that once you identify along that direction, then you produce close time like curves and you would like to cut them out. It's natural to cut them out. And this produces singularities, uh, causal singularities. I mean, there are geodesic that terminate there. Now, the geometry that results from this construction is a uh, warped conformal Minkowski 3 times uh, S1 uh, that you can see there. And indeed, you can see that psi squared is the norm of this killing vector, identification killing vector. And it's also where, where, the, where you have this causal singularity, psi squared goes to zero and the metric loses entirely one component. So it's, it is actually, uh, it degenerates. So in a, an ordinary context, uh, there's not much one can do. Um, that's a genuine singularity and one has to just raise it. But embedding this into high spin gravity and at the same time, sorry, let me, and at the same time, um, 
uh, working at the level of the unfolded formulation makes things a little better. Uh, why? Because essentially one can construct now the BTZ metric intrinsically by guessing a gauge function that produces that, that space. Well, without, I will just uh, uh, tell you the result of this operation. What happens is that one doesn't produce the BTZ4, but an extension of it, uh, like two BTZ4 attached by the singularity. Okay, this is maybe artificial if the fluctuation fields experience that singularity as an actual pathological surface. So one could ask, does it happen in, uh, in unfolding? Well, in the ordinary case, the singularity, the singularity is definitely pathological. If you look at scalar field over the BTZ singularity in BTZ4, you would see that there is a pathological behavior, not because they diverge, but because they oscillate with frequency that diverge at the singularity. So definitely it is a pathological point. But once you assemble the scalar field fluctuations with all its higher spin counterpart, uh, much as uh, it happened in the black hole case, uh, in the Schwarzschild black hole case, you see that uh, these type of singularities also reassemble into a sort of delta function behavior for the uh, generating function, therefore making the story a little better. So the fluctuation master fields, when uh, looked uh, uh, from the unfolded point of view, experience the singularity as a smooth surface. And unfolding enters in two, two ways. Uh, sorry, um, uh, high spin gravity um, and unfolding enter in, uh, uh, two, in two different ways. First, because in the unfolding, you never have to invert the field bind to formulate uh, equations. So even a degenerate metric might be, um, might, uh, you, you might tolerate it. And number two, because in, in the high spin gravity context, you have this, uh, the proper variable you should look at is uh, the master field. And as I said, this uh, individual divergences reassemble into some uh, more meaningful object in, uh, in uh, the fiber in Y space. So to conclude, um, the unfolded formulation, what I, mean, what I meant to say, my main message was that the unfolded formulation and the embedding in high spin gravity are in principle capable of offering an interesting window on the deeply string regime of this theory. And, uh, but possibly also uh, they're able to, uh, they might enable us to treat other mathematical physics questions that are outside even the realm of high spin gravity. So I'll definitely stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, is there any question at this point here? Um, yes, Larissa. Uh, hi, I have hi. one uh, naive question. So uh, about this um, space-time fiber duality. Yes. Is it possible to think of this as at each point in each X, you have L infinity algebra over it. And then you have actually collection in every point in a sense, having a Lee infinity algebra in the end. Uh, well, yes, uh, I think so. Even though uh, I would have uh, associated the L infinity context more when, when it comes to actually interaction at the interaction level, really what here, the, the structure that is below the high spin algebra deformed with interaction is definitely an L infinity algebra. So uh, you are totally 100% right on that. Uh, um, but the, it, at three level, I would say uh, there's an even simpler way of maybe seeing this. It's just the fact that once you embed any, let, let's say, once you look at the high spin gravity context, then the fiber space is infinite dimensional as much as the base space. So first of all, you have room for some sort of encoding of things one into another. And the way that happens is in fact, reminiscent a lot of a Penrose transform. Uh, maybe that is probably the closest analogy as was uh, stressed by Vasilyam himself uh, in, in a paper long ago. Uh, if you're familiar with that, then maybe that's the closest analogy uh, to, to understand why you can encode um, somehow dynamical local degrees of freedom inside into the fiber space. Mm 
But Alien Infinity structures is all over the, the place in, uh, when it comes to interacting high spin theories, yes. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, you, I'm aware that there are solutions of uh, uh, general relativity equations that have uh, degenerate metrics uh, somewhere, but uh, uh, as far as I know, these occur in uh, lower dimensional submanifolds. Uh, are you aware of solutions where the metric becomes degenerate on an open set? Um, uh, well, mm, well, exactly. I'm not sure what you mean. For example, the BTZ4 here, that it's degenerate on a hyperbola. This region, psi squared equal to zero, it's, it was invisible given the speed. So it's, uh, but that's, it's an hyperboloid. Uh, lower dimensional submanifold. It is lower dimensional, yes. And it's a two sheeted hyperboloid, which essentially would be past and future singularity. Yeah, but could uh, the metric be degenerate, uh, I don't know, for t less than zero or something like that uh, on a whole uh, region which has the same dimension as the, uh, as the space time? Oh, okay. Ah, sorry. Okay, I see. Um... I, I have never seen any, but maybe you, you know. Um... I, no, I don't think so. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen it, let's say. I, I, I'll, I'll try and think, but I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Right now, I uh, no, it doesn't come to mind. Good. Thanks. Uh, I see that uh, the next uh, speaker has uh, appeared. Uh, so let's uh, thank uh, Carlo. Thank for you. This nice talk. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks. Can you un, uh, sure. unshare your screen? Good. Uh, Simon, do you hear me? Do you hear me okay? Uh, I suppose you are Simon speaking, so yes, I hear you. Um, <laughs> so, good. Um, by the way, I'm Roberto Percacci. I'm the chair. Oh, hi, Roberto. I know. Yeah, we've met before. <laughs> Can you please uh, share your screen at this point? Okay. You see that okay? Excellent. We see and we hear. Okay. So uh, Simon will now talk about anomalies, symmetric mass generation and staggered fermions. Uh, you have 25 minutes for your talk plus five minutes uh, questions. And I will uh, warn you five minutes before the, uh, de the, the deadline of the 25 minutes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here at this meeting in Corfu. Sadly, I can't actually be there and sitting on the island there, but uh, we'll have to do as best we can with a remote. So yes, I'm gonna talk about uh, anomalies uh, and symmetric mass generation for these uh, uh, Kähler Dirac fermions. And I'll, I'll, uh, and I'll say more about how they relate to staggered fermions as we go along. Um, so here's my plan. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what are Kähler Dirac fermions for people who are not familiar with that and how they connect to ordinary Dirac fermions. Um, and along the way, I'll have to um, uh, sort of uh, flesh out this connection to uh, lattice fermions in particular staggered lattice fermions. Um, so I'll spend some of the time, most of the time I'll be talking in the continuum. I'll discuss um, a new gravitational anomaly that occurs for Kähler Dirac fermions. It's just different from the normal kinds of anomalies you expect for vial fermions in curved space. So uh, I'll, I'll flesh that out. Um, and I'll talk also about a, a, a new a global discrete anomaly that arises for these Kähler Dirac systems for strictly for what are called reduced Kähler Dirac fermions. So I'll tell you what the reduced Kähler Dirac fermion exactly is. And then I'll go into the context 
context for how these things feed into constraints on consistent interacting theories of fermions in flat space. Uh, and that will have some repercussions for this problem of symmetric mass generation, which is the idea that you should be able to, or in certain cases, you can gap fermions in systems without breaking any uh, global chiral symmetries. Um, and I'll say a little bit about prospects of that uh, for that as well. So this is work done mostly with my students. Uh, Newman Butt is now uh, actually a postdoc at Banner champaign uh, The other guys are still in Syracuse. And there'll be more details on this archive paper, which I've given the reference for here. Okay, so what are Kähler Dirac fermions? So they give an alternative um, solution to this problem of square, square rooting the Laplace. And this is the problem that Dirac faced back in 1928 and, he, and, and led to the Dirac equation. Uh, what, what you can see now is that if uh, Dirac uh, um, had at his, at his hands basically uh, modern differential geometry, he could have come up with a different solution. So it's possible to write a linear equation down uh, involving the exterior derivative, which automatically squares to the Laplacian, essentially. So here it is, it's just it's this uh, D minus D dagger. I can put a mass term in if I want M and that D minus D dagger squares to box. All right. So clearly it operates on a collection of forms, a collection of P forms, right? Because D and D dagger naturally act on forms. And so the, so, but this is a, a possible, if I take phi to be sort of a fermionic variable, something which anti-commutes, this is a possible equation for fermions. And in fact, it is related to the usual Dirac equation in the following way. I can take those forms, you know, the zero form, the one form, et cetera, and I can use them to form a matrix by just using them as coefficients in this expansion over products of gamma matrices. So I just take the index structure of the form and I apply it to a suitable products of gamma matrices, as I show here, and build myself, for example, in four dimensions, a four by four matrix out of these forms, all right? And then you can take that four by four matrix and show that it satisfies the ordinary Dirac equation in this way. So reading off by columns, it, it, it corresponds to basically a set of degenerate um, Dirac fermions um, for each of these forms. So I just read off the columns of this four by four matrix in four dimensions, and each column corresponds to a Dirac spinner. And so I just get a set of Dirac spinners that naturally follow from this decomposition in flat space. So it's very important that, the, the con that you put this constraint in place. This is not true if the, the background space is curved. All right. So this has been known for a long time. It's not particularly a, a new thing. And it's been known in lattice gauge theory for, for, a very, for at least 30 years. All right. So that, but that's the starting point for the talk. Uh, let me say a little bit more about um, what happens in curved space. Well, the remarkable thing about Kähler Dirac fermions is the fundamental equation does not change when I go to curved space at all. It's still K minus M operating on some collection of forms equals zero. However, the matrix representation of that does, does change. Of course, I, to talk about spinners uh, in curved space, I need to introduce a spin connection and, a, and some sort of frame. So the frame being roughly speaking the square root of the metric. And I have to replace uh, my uh, simple um, Dirac equation by something involving the covariant derivative, uh, uh, which contains the spin connection and also the frame. So the representation in terms of spinners changes quite a bit and the coupling to gravity basically is quite different uh, from the ordinary Dirac equation, right? So you get this commutator structure with the spin connection in the case of Kähler Dirac fermions. So it's quite different in that regard. However, what we're going to be most interested in is a particular linear operator, which um, naturally anti-commutes with the Kähler Dirac operator. So this is a very simple operator. It just takes a, a P form and flips that sign, depending on whether the form is even or odd, all right? And it's very easy to show that in any curved background, that operator gamma anti-commutes with K. So that allows me to generate an exact U1 symmetry of the massless Kähler Dirac action, which just takes the form of taking this uh, Kähler Dirac field and, and basically rotating it by a phase where that phase depends on this operator gamma, all right? And do something similar for phi bar if I'm using phi bar to construct my Kähler Dirac action. All right, so that's, that's the, the symmetry we'll be showing as anomalous in just a moment, all right? So this is a symmetry of the massless Kähler Dirac action. If you want to know what it looks like in the matrix language, it's, it's kind of essentially a kind of twisted chiral symmetry. It's not chiral, the vanilla chiral symmetry. It's a twisted chiral symmetry, which involves both the 
rotation in flavor space, this internal flavor space, this space of four fermions, uh, four degenerate fermions in four dimensions, and the usual uh, spinner space. But from our perspective, let's just think about it as, as a, a natural symmetry, which occurs for Kähler Dirac fermions. It allows me to project those Kähler Dirac fermions down to reduce the number of degrees of freedom by a factor of two by just using a projector, which is rather like the usual you know, chiral projectors for Dirac fermions. So a half one plus or minus gamma on phi gives me a reduced Kähler Dirac fermion. Those reduced Kähler Dirac fermions satisfy an action which just couples, say, a uh, uh, a, fer a Kähler Dirac fermion with a minus eigenvalue to one with a plus. So this is very similar to the way you would take a Dirac action and decompose it into left and right vial pieces. You can do something very similar for a Kähler Dirac fermion. You can decompose it into two reduced fermions. And then so I, for the massless case, I can just consider dropping one of those terms and just writing down a single action and the Kähler Dirac operator anti-commutes with that gamma. So I get a, it couples plus to minus, right? So it's, it's sort of a, analogous to what one would do with a Dirac fermion. Okay, one of the cute things about Kähler lattice uh, is Kähler Dirac fermions is they have a natural a lattice implementation. So I can approximate my continuum space by some sort of oriented triangulation, some simplicial manifold. I can place P forms on P simplices. Uh, technically, they become uh, co-chains, in fact. So I can just, so I have a zero form living on a site, a one form would live naturally on a link, a two form would live on a plaquette, et cetera, et cetera. I can replace D and D dagger, those exterior derivative, the exterior derivative is adjoint by boundary and co-boundary operators in a very well-defined way. I won't go into the details because it would take, but it's this well-known uh, technology for mapping um, uh, the, the exterior derivative into these boundary operators. And I can write down a lattice, a discrete form of the Kähler Dirac equation in the following form. So it involves delta minus delta bar minus m acting on this uh, set of uh, lattice fields equals zero. So what's unusual about this uh, way of uh, discussing fermions on lattices is that this way, the, the, sol the lattice solutions of this equation go smoothly into the continuum solutions. There is no additional states, no fermion doubling. This is all guaranteed by theorems in homology theory. And, and specifically the zero mode structure of the lattice equation is precisely the same as that in the continuum. So I can conserve uh, the zero modes exactly by this procedure. And that's gonna be very important when we discuss things like staggered fermions later on, and anomalies in staggered fermions in particular. All right, so in fact, if I take, although I've made this discussion in terms of random triangulations, and, and this technology goes through there for any random triangulation of any curved space, it can, if you go, restrict yourself to just, um, uh, just a simple torus and use a, a simple regular hypercubic lattice on that torus, this will actually lead to a, um, the staggered fermion operator, which is familiar from lattice QCD. So to make our arguments, we'll need to, in general, live on a more random triangulation. But it should be noted that, in fact, a lot of what I have to say will work just as well for ordinary staggered fermions on hypercubic lattices. Uh, the sort of uh, technology that's used to discuss lattice QCD uh, sort of in everyday terms. All right. So anyway, so lattice Kähler Dirac fermions or well, Kähler Dirac fermions are much more compatible with the lattice than ordinary Dirac fermions. There's a natural place for all the, these anti-symmetric forms to live on the discrete structure and you can conserve a great deal of the uh, structure of the continuum equation when you, when you discretize the theory in particular the sort of topological aspects. Okay, so let's get back to this anomaly having made that point about lattice fermions. So, um, I showed you before, I mentioned that, that, that in fact, that this, this because gamma anti-commutes with K, then the lattice Kähler Dirac action is explicitly, or sorry, the continuum Kähler Dirac action is explicitly invariant under this transformation. But of course, if I'm uh, worrying about quantum mechanics, I have to worry about the measure too. So when I look at my integration measure for Kähler Dirac fermions, which is a product over all the subsimplices or the forms, the P forms of phi and phi bar, the easiest way to do this calculation is to go to the lattice. We've done the calculation in the continuum and it can be done and it gives the same result. But the very simplest way to think about this is to live on the lattice because then I, I can explicitly figure out how all the phi's and phi bars for all my different subsimplices transform. When I do this phase transformation according to gamma, 
I get precisely factors which count the number of zero forms, the number of one forms, that is the number of points, the number of links, the number of two simplices, et cetera, all weighted by factors of e to the two i alpha or minus two i alpha, depending on the sign of gamma. The two just comes because I have a phi and a phi bar. When I add those phases up, I find that the, the phase transformation of my lattice representation of the Kähler Dirac equation is transforms by precisely a phase which depends only on the Euler character of the background, all right? So in general, it's easy to see that this breaks the U1 symmetry down to Z4, all right? If, if I take a sphere, for example. So if I compactify even an even dimensional space into a sphere and I apply this reasoning, I'll see that in general, there's an anomaly for this U1 get symmetry that anomaly breaks down to Z4, all right? This Z4 symmetry is sufficient to prohibit mass terms in the quantum effective action, but allows for things like, for example, four fermion operators, all right? So this lattice calculation I just sketched out very briefly here agrees with the continuum calculation when I work in the matrix representation. And it's an example of a quantum mechanical anomaly that you can get with a finite number of degrees of freedom. So there is no need uh, for the Hilbert Hotel here. You can get this anomaly out of triangulations with a minimal number of points, and you'll see that explicitly the measure for integration is anomalous in general. So that's kind of nice. Um, so let me take that uh, as a basis, that Z4 symmetry, and try to write down theories of interacting Kähler Dirac fermions. And I'm going to think about reduced Kähler Dirac fermions. So these are, nat these are the natural massless fermions that occur here. So I'm going to imagine taking two, for example, reduced Kähler Dirac fermions, coupling them through K as I did before, and then coupling them to a scalar field in addition sigma. I'm gonna extend the Z4 symmetry I just found that resulted from this curved background. Um, and I can do that if I just take, that, that implies that phi goes to I gamma phi. And if I just take sigma to flip sign under that same transformation, then this action is invariant. So in the dot, dot, dots here, I could put all kinds of uh, even phi interactions in there. So I could generate things like four Fermi terms by having, for example, a sigma squared term in there if I wanted. However, let's not worry about those higher order terms for the moment. Let's just concentrate on this Z4 symmetry. Let's integrate the Kähler Dirac fields out. I'll get a Fafian because I started with a reduced Kähler Dirac field. So it's naturally gives me a Fafian. I get a phi and I, the phi bar has gone away if you want. Uh, and that's a function of K and then this uh, coupling to the sigma field. So this is explicitly an anti-symmetric matrix. And so I can define the Fafian as usual as the product of eigenvalues in the upper half plane in the background of some reference field configuration sigma. So let think of that as a constant. So it looks a bit like a Majorana mass or something like that. So we'll define the Fafian to be a smooth function of sigma. This means that as I, as I integrate over sigma in my path integral, I just follow my original eigenvalues um, uh, to define the Fafian. So I have some initial set of eigenvalues and some reference sigma zero, and I just follow those eigenvalues as the sigma field fluctuates. All right. And so you see there's a possibility that Fafian itself will undergo a sign change if any of those eigenvalues flow through the origin. All right. So this is very similar to the kind of arguments that Witten made for a single vial fermion in SU2 gauge theory. It's a very similar kind of global anomaly we're after here. So I can imagine interpolating this sigma between, say, plus and minus sigma by introducing this variable s, which runs from 1 to minus 1. And I can understand where the Fafian change sign by just looking at how the eigenvalues eigenvalues behave near s equals zero, near the origin. And clearly they change sign for a pair of K reduced Kähler Dirac fields as I change the sign of s. So the Fafian is an actually an anti-symmetric function of a pair of reduced Kähler Dirac fermions. That means the partition function when I integrate over sigma will actually vanish because of this. So if the rest of my terms of my action are sigma even, then the, the full partition function vanishes. And of course, the theory just basically doesn't exist. So to avoid this discrete anomaly, you need the eigenvalues to flow in pairs through the origin. That means you need to have multiples of four reduced Kähler Dirac fields in your theory to avoid this discrete global anomaly. Now, that's interesting, but let's go back to the, how, this, how this plays out in the context of ordinary fermions. So I know in four dimensions, each of these reduced Kähler Dirac fields gives rise to two Dirac, remember half of four, or equivalently for real representations for Majorana spinners. So this global anomaly on Kähler Dirac fields actually says that in flat space, these theories have to possess multiples of 16 Majorana spinners. 
All right. And this result actually is consistent with results from topological insulators and from a variety of new work uh, originating in the die fried theorem, using, which talks about the cancellation of spin Z4 anomalies for vial fermions. So this result, what we've gotten out of catered rack fermions rather simply, actually is quite consistent with what's con currently considered um, uh, the relevant fermion counting in four dimensions uh, for um, interacting fermionic systems that we have to move in multiples of 16 vial or 16 myron fermions. And it comes out very nicely from this uh, sort of uh, argument for Kayla Um So now I want to move on to the, another part of my talk, which is to sort of say, how, what's the consequence of this for things like symmetric mass generation? So typically when fermions acquire masses, they do it by breaking symmetries, either explicitly like a Dirac mass term, spontaneously like the chiral condensate in QCD, or possibly via anomalies like the eta prime mass, right? And you can ask, is that, does this exhaust the possibilities? And the answer is of course, no. In principle, fermion masses can arise without breaking these global symmetries, providing all the Toft anomalies vanish, all right? And this, when this happens, it's called symmetric mass generation. And there are examples of this in condensed matter physics. Uh, and, uh, which are kind of uh, uh, driving quite a lot of the field at the moment. And uh, just to remind you, a Toft anomaly just arises when I try to imagine uh, uh, gauging a global symmetry. If I have some non-zero anomaly coefficient um, that, that survives, it's an RG invariant into the infrared and guarantees that I need massless particles in the infrared, which have the same anomaly coefficient. The only way that can happen is I have, if I have massless composite fermions in the IR or if G breaks spontaneously, all right? So the idea here is if I'm to gap fermions without breaking any symmetries, then that means that there are only massive states in the IR. So there can only, so there has to be so zero anomaly in the IR. So there has to be zero anomaly in the UV. So I have to cancel off all my Toft anomalies if I'm to achieve symmetric mass generation. And what I just showed you is these Kähler Dirac fermions have a new set of anomalies associated with this Z4 symmetry and it has to be canceled off in the UV if I'm going to symmetrically, if I'm to generate masses for those fermions in the IR. All right, so I'm imagining I have to go through some sort of at least four fermion operator to do that because that's Z4 symmetric. Um, and then I'm going to need sort of strong interactions on, on top of that. But if I'm to succeed in this, I have to use the right number of fermions. I have to use multiples of four reduced Kähler-Dirac fermions for this to have work at all, right? So cancellation of anomalies is at least a necessary condition for symmetric mass generation. It may not be sufficient, but it's certainly a necessary condition. All right. And so one example of how you might do this is you could literally take the uh, Yukawa coupling like this. It couples to two Kähler Dirac fields through a sigma AB. These Kähler Dirac fields are projected to the, in what, for example, the one zero representation of SO4 that's naturally describes four reduced fermions. Okay, and the one zero representation is a vector representation. So this is a perfectly allowable for fermion term. You may need more than that, but you minimally need something like that. So there are examples in condensed matter physics where four fermion terms in low enough dimensions will certainly do the trick for you. Um, so let me now try to make contact with staggered fermions. Um, these ten, these uh, form fields I was using for my Kähler Dirac description, I can always map them into single component fields living on a lattice by simply mapping them like this. So this tensor index structure gets mapped into a lattice site for the single component staggered field. And then you can, as I said before, you can map your discrete Kähler Dirac action into a staggered fermion action, which looks something like this. So it couples these single component fields to a symmetric difference operator. These are the famous staggered fermion phases. So I can certainly take this technology uh, we've discussed for Kähler Dirac fermions and apply it now directly to staggered fermions and this anomaly structure I talked about will survive equally well in the staggered fermion language. So it's gonna give constraints on what are consistent interacting theories of staggered fermions as well. Uh, so the a little bit of work has been done on a particular model which implements that SO4 for Fermi interaction I just sketched before. So I can take my kinetic operator for the staggered fermions. Um, I can add to it a four Fermi term. It's essentially unique. So I just take a product of the four Staggered fields, chi one, chi two, chi three, chi four. That gives me a unique four Fermi term with some coupling constant. I can ask what the phase structure of this lattice model is. Okay, it clearly has the SO4 symmetry built in. It has this Z4 symmetry, which is manifested now by taking a staggered field and multiplying by I times epsilon of X. Epsilon X is the site parity in this case. So it's the representation of, of that discrete Z4 gamma uh, in the staggered fermion language. It also has a shift symmetry as well. 
So these symmetries, again, prohibit all the bilinear terms you could think of in the effective action, but they do allow for the support limiting term, right? So in three dimensions, this model has been studied quite a lot. Um, when G goes to zero, I had just massless fermions. And I know what the continuum limit looks like. I can easily do a strong coupling expansion for a large G and show that there's a four fermion condensate formed, but that condensate is completely symmetric. It breaks no lattice symmetries whatsoever, all right? But nevertheless, there has to be at least one phase transition between these two regimes. And you can see this, this, this U here is the same as G, G squared strictly. Here is a certain fermionic susceptibility. This is work from Shailesh Chandra Sakar and, and, and collaborators over a, uh, a couple of years ago. And so what you see is a nice peak in susceptibility corresponding to a phase transition in the system. And that peak scales. So this is a continuous phase transition. It's, um, and these guys have worked very hard to actually illuminate to figure out what the critical exponents are, right? So there's a possibility here that the, you can have a genuine non-interacting um, fermionic theory in, in three dimensions um, where the fermions acquire masses through a four fermion term without breaking any symmetries whatsoever. So that's consistent the, with the anomaly cancellation I talked about because this has, the naive continuum of this theory has exactly 16 Majorana fermions, which is the right number. This idea survives also into four dimensions. So here's some work that we did a few years ago on the same model I showed about the same staggered fermion model I talked about before. This shows the four fermion condensate switching on at some value of G. Um, strictly speaking, it's never zero. It's not an order parameter in the usual sense because the symmetry is never broken, but it switches on around G of one. And here's a corresponding susceptibility here, um, which uh, shows a nice peak structure here. If you look at the correlation length in the vicinity of this peak, you find that it's diverging very rapidly with lattice size. So although the peak saturates, the correlation length is getting very long. And in fact, it's extremely hard to run around here for that reason. So again, notice this continuum limit describes exactly 16 Majorana fermions. So there is some numerical evidence for the existence of these massive symmetric phases from lattice simulation. And then we think we have some understanding of why that is now, because these staggered fermion systems are basically equivalent to Kähler Dirac systems. Kähler Dirac systems are only consistent when you get when they have a certain number of Kähler Dirac fields sufficient to cancel off this anomaly, uh, which which we discovered in in the in the context of a, sort of a curved gravitational background. Um, so well, let me. So, left. Sorry, five minutes. Three minutes. Great. Well, I'm on my last slide, so I'm more than good. All right. So I've told you that the Kähler Dirac equation gives you some alternative to the Dirac equation. Uh, in four-dimensional flat space, it's just equivalent to four degenerate Dirac fermions, so it doesn't tell you, uh, apparently doesn't seem to tell you anything much new. In a curved background, the coupling to gravity is, is very different. So you know with Dirac fermions, you have to introduce spin connections and frames, all right? And not all manifolds even admit Dirac fermions. Basically, Kähler Dirac fermions can be written down on any smooth manifold and don't require any of that technology. The equation is just the same as it is in flat space. However, we did show that, in fact, there's a gravitational anomaly which is unique to Kähler Dirac fermions, which arises in this in a, in a general curve background, and it breaks a, a, a U1 symmetry of the Kähler Dirac system down to Z4 in any even dimension, right? And furthermore, this Z4 suffers from a global anomaly, uh, unless the number of reduced staggered fermions, uh, sorry, reduced Kähler Dirac fermions is a multiple of four. All right, so that we just gave a, an argument which is very similar to Witten's original argument for vial fermions in SU2, which shows the Fafian is ill-defined unless you have multiples of four reduced Kähler Dirac fermions. That's interesting because when you decompose those Kähler Dirac fermions into regular spinners, you find it gives you this constraint on the number of Majoran or vial fermions, which agrees nicely with uh, condensed matter arguments for topological insulators, which have been extended up to four dimensions. It's also consistent with what we know uh, um, of the, the various discrete symmetries you can write down for vial fermions in, an, in a conventional treatment uh, based on, for example, things like chiral fermion parity in two dimensions or uh, spin Z4 symmetry in four dimensions. So these numbers we're getting from Kähler Dirac through this Z4 global anomaly agree with those uh, uh, anomaly arguments rooted in the Diefried theorem. So that's kind of nice. Canceling off this global anomaly is necessary to, if you have to have any chance of symmetric mass generation in a system with interacting fermions. Uh, 
All right, so symmetric mass generation is just this idea we would like to gap fermions without breaking global chiral symmetries. In general, it's hard to do, but it's not impossible if you can satisfy all, the, if you can cancel off all the toped anomalies. So um, we have some evidence. In fact, this is actually happening by mapping the system we're talking about into, st into lattice staggered fermions, conventional staggered fermions with a if I choose the right number of staggered fermions and I write the right type of Z4 invariant interactions uh, down, then I can actually show explicitly numerical evidence for the existence of these, uh, these massive uh, uh, fermion phases. Um, and so that's sort of, that's, you can think of some of this work as just justifying some earlier work from a few years ago with uh, staggered fermions. But now we have this continuum perspective um, what's really crucial about k dirac fermions from the perspective of discretization is that you can, you can discretize them in a way which preserves this anomaly. That's what's key to the understanding uh, a lot of this work, right? So, so unlike ordinary Dirac fermions, which are, find it, which are, for which there are a lot of tensions when you try to discretize them, right? We know about those tensions. We talk about them in terms of fermion doubling, the problems of reproducing the continuum anomaly, et cetera, et cetera. There's no natural place for spinners to live in a lattice. Once you go to Kehler Dirac fermions, there is a natural place for spinners to live. They live on simplices because they are basically reparameterized as anti-symmetric tensor fields. Um, and not only that, but you can preserve the zero mode structure exactly on the lattice. And that means, and that's why you can get this, this anomaly uh, structure also survives at the discrete level and has implications for things like staggered fermions uh, and, and numerical work in that regard. Of course, the, the $10 million question here is whether these new ideas about symmetric mass generation in, in the context, say, of Kehler Dirac fermions can be used to gap out mirror models where I'm trying to construct chiral lattice gates there is. Right, so this is very much a, uh, an unknown question, but it, it's always been speculated that you, know, you can start from some vector theory in, on the lattice and then take say the right-handed states and try to drive them up to the cutoff without touching the left-handed sector. And all the original efforts to do this failed for various reasons, uh, but a lot of them were to, in many, in many cases, the reasons they failed were that there was symmetries were broken spontaneously in the course of trying to gap the right-handed mirror fermions. And, those, the, uh, and that symmetry breakdown led to a coupling of the left and right-handed modes and a, a, in a, basically invalidated their approach. The idea with symmetric mass generation is maybe you may be able to get those right-handed states without um, inducing any symmetry breakdown and any coupling to the left-handed modes. In that way, you might be able to make some progress on this old problem of formulating uh, chiral gauge theories on the lattice. And there's some hope maybe, I think, that that some of these new ideas about killer direct fermions and about these new anomalies that have been discovered uh, will have some bearing on, on that very old and, and important problem. So I'm finished. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I'll hear for a few questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you for this uh, interesting talk. Um, is there any question here? Right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that, um, it's a, let's say we take four dimensions mm -hmm. and the Kehler Dirac fermions are equivalent to essentially four flavors of fermions. And yep. the gamma that you uh, introduced, the capital gamma, is essentially yeah. the you should run off this symmetry, but with some rotation in the player space as well. Correct, yeah. yeah I understand that, right? Eh? So the, the question I want to ask is in the context of topological insulators, do you know what this uh, flavor rotation would be like? So it's unclear to me exactly. Uh, the, the discussions of topological insulators use conventional fermions, so Majorana fermions and things like that. And although the counting, the fermion counting we're getting from these k dirac description matches in every dimension to the, the corresponding critical number of fermions you get from the topological insider arguments, the symmetries are not the same. So maybe if I go on, on a, little, a little table here, 
So for example, if you're discussing topological insulators, then it's time reversal symmetry in one dimension which gives me the constraints on the number of Majoranas. But that turns out to be also the constraint you get from Kähler Dirac fermions. Same thing is true for two dimensions, chiral fermion parity. It's all coming from this gamma operator basically for us, but it's a different set of discrete symmetries that, that you need uh, if you use if you want conventional fermions. So I don't really understand it. I mean, this spin Z4 symmetry is very similar to our epsilon symmetry because for example, it basically rotates uh, left-handed fermions by plus I and right-handed fermions by minus I. That's just like our Z4 symmetry for reduced, uh, for reduced k Dirac fermions. So in that case, I can sort of see an explicit connection between you know, the symmetry that's used in the topological insulator picture and the symmetry we're using here. But in some of the other dimensions, particularly in odd dimensions, it's not so clear. It seems like a different symmetry is needed in the conventional sort of fermion picture than we need here, which is all everything for us is mediated through gamma, right? I don't know whether that's helpful. I don't fully understand the connection is the answer, but there seems to be one in the sense that the critical number of Majoranas uh, always matches. So it depends on how many Majoranas or vial fermions you can package into a Kähler Dirac field. And that, that together with the restriction that you need for, to allow for at least four fermion operators seems to give you the right counting in any number of dimensions that we thought about anyway. Is, is that helpful? I don't see any other questions. So uh, thanks, uh, Simon. And uh, we close our session here for today. <laughs>